Good evening, everyone. Sorry that we're starting a few minutes late, but evidently the parking lot is quite full. And so they're still coming in. But anyway, welcome everyone to Center Presents. Uh, before we start tonight's program, just to remind you that in two weeks in this room, uh, William, the Center Presents will be hosting William Gazy, classic guitarist. And he uh, plays extensively in orchestras and dance ensembles and um, choruses and opera and theater and film and TV, so he plays quite a bit. He's played with the Montpelier Chamber Society, he played with the uh, Harry Park Partridge Ensemble and also the Philadelphia Guitar Ensemble as well as many solo programs. He graduated from Temple University School of Music, was on their facu uh, faculty, and now lives in West Lebanon. So he will be here in two weeks. Um, on August 17th, we are presenting New England Lighthouses and the people who kept them. <laughs> and you know the appeal of lighthouses is really, uh, it's a wonderful historical appeal. And um, they are sort of in the past, but they were very vital to maritime economy back in, in the beginning of the century. And it is being presented by Jeremy Dontremont as being uh, sponsored by the New Hampshire Humanities. And he will be telling us about the history of these lighthouses and also, he has some very colorful and dramatic stories about the people who lived in them. And he is the president of the American Lighthouse uh, Foundation, and he has uh, founded the Portsmouth Harbor Lighthouse Foundation. So that should be an interesting topic. And now tonight, I'm very happy to have with us Judith Price, who is a has been a resident of Eastman for 40 years, part-time, and she is presenting tonight's program, Raoul Wallenberg, The Righteous Gentile. Uh, Judith uh, owes her life to him. Uh, when she was a baby with her mother, they were saved from Nazi Hungary and by Raoul, who was a Swedish diplomat and he saved many Jewish people from boxcars, from the ghettos of Budapest, from the gas chambers, and she is here to tell his story. And I just want you to know that um, uh, this program is being recorded by Nick Kleinschmidt. He is a wonderful young Eastman volunteer. And he said that if any of you want to ask a question, you want to speak, and you're uncomfortable being recorded, just look at him and say, cut, and he'll press the button. <laughs> but anyway, just to make you aware. So please enjoy tonight's presentation. Drew. Thank you. Jewish, two were not, and we all friends, we are getting real well, and we were sitting at the table, and people asked me, many people always ask me about my background, where I'm from, where's my accent from, etc. 
Can you hear me? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, can you, can, you didn't hear me what I just said before? No. Okay, so anyway, so we were at dinner and uh, people were asking me questions where I perform, etc. And I talked to them about Raul Wallenberg. And believe it or not, out of the eight women, only one knew who Raul Wallenberg was. When I walked out of the dinner, I said to myself, that's unacceptable. He is so, such an incredible person, and he's saved so many lives. You cannot just forget about him. We really need to leave his name around and alive, and, and I'm gonna do something about it. So I came up here to Eastman last summer, and the weather was coming in July, so I spent a lot of time doing research, writing, reading, and came up with this research study, which I am going to talk about today. Now, I am not a technically very capable person, so you have to bear with me. Um, okay. Um, usually this presentation is been, the, the, the PowerPoint is done by my mind, an assistant who helps me out at the Holocaust Museum in Naples. So this is the first time that I'm actually doing the PowerPoint by myself. So anyways, so let's start. Let's talk about Rob Wallenberg. How can an individual fight tyranny what can be done to preserve liberty against overwhelming odds? There are few stories as stirring as that of Raoul Wallenberg. He defied the evil forces of Adolf Hitler and Joseph Stalin, two of history's worst mass murderers. Of course, since then we have another one in Russia. He confronted racists, <coughs> torturers, assassins, and even Hitler's chief <coughs> executioner, Adolf Eichmann, while saving almost 100,000 lives. More astounding, he saved lives inside enemy territory, since escape was impossible. He was armed only with a pistol, which he never used. Working in Nazi-controlled Hungary, Wallenberg liberated thousands of Jews <clears throat> from, from boxcars, bombed by for the gas chambers. He pulled Jews out of the death marches. He saved Jews from being shot and dumped in the Danube, including my own grandmother. He single-handedly thwarted Nazi plans to massacre 70,000 Jews remaining in the Budapest Central Ghetto. Rob Gustav Wallenberg was born near Stockholm, Sweden, on August 4, 1912. His parents both came from prominent Swedish families. Catholic families, whose members included bankers, bishops, diplomats, and professors. Wallenberg's father, Rolf Oskar Wallenberg, a lieutenant in the Swedish Navy, had died of an illness three months before his son was, was born. His paternal grandfather, Gustav Wallenberg, a respected diplomat, respected diplomat, took charge of shaping young Rolf's life. The elder Wallenberg, the grandfather, raised his grandson as a citizen of the world, ensuring he had opportunities to learn about different cultures and languages and dispatching him on trips around Europe and other locales. Gustav arranged for Raoul to broaden his vision by spending summers in France, Germany, and he learned French and German as well as English 
Gustav arranged for Raoul to broaden his vision by spending summers in, in, in other countries as well. The elder, <coughs> the elder grandfather, <coughs> uh, to better understand America, Rob enrolled, enrolled at the University of Michigan, where he earned an architect degree in 1935. But the market for architects was small in Sweden. So, so his grandfather sent him to Cape Town, South Africa, to work in a bank where Rob discovered that banking was not for him. <laughs> After six months, he became an intern with a Dutch business in Haifa, Palestine, where he heard European refugees tell horrifying stories of Nazi barbarism. Wallenberg was in Palestine <clears throat> when he first met Jews who had escaped Hitler's Germany. The, sto the stories of Nazi persecution affected him deeply. Perhaps because he had a very human attitude to life, because he owned a drop of Jewish blood, Raoul's grandmother's grandmother was a Jew. His name was Benedict, who arrived in Sweden at the end of 18th century. Wallenberg returned to Sweden from Haifa in 1936 and resumed his interest in business. So his cousins <coughs> were in the business, with the business world. Raul was eventually brought together with Kalaman Lauer, a Hungarian Jew, who was the director of a Swedish-based import and export company specializing in food and delicacies. <clears throat> Thanks to Raoul's excellent language skills, and his greater freedom of movement throughout Europe, he was a perfect business partner for Lauer. Within eight months, Wallenberg was the joint owner of the international director of the Mid-European Trading Company. Through his trips in Nazi-occupied France and Germany, Raoul quickly learned how the German bureaucracy functioned. He also made several trips to Hungary and to in Budapest, where he visited the Lauer's family. At that time, Hungary was still a relatively safe place to live. In fact, it was in a hostile environment. During the spring of 1944, the world had mostly awoken to realize what Hitler's final solution to the Jewish problem actually meant. In May 1944, the first authentic eyewitness report of what was happening in Auschwitz extermination camp finally reached the Western world. It came from two Jews who had managed to escape the gas chambers in Nazi Germany. Hitler's plans for the extermination of European Jewry were now known. At the beginning of 1944, there still lived an estimated 700,000 Jews in Hungary, a country, a country which had joined Germany in the war against the Soviet Union in 1941. Wallenberg certainly didn't look like the staff heroes I made of. He was of medium height, with brown eyes, a large nose, small chin, and receding curly brown hair. An associate described him as a thin man, rather shy, and virtually fearless. 
He dressed elegantly and was always well shaven. A quick thinker, energetic, brave, and compassionate. And he had a famous name. The company of the Wallenberg family had business ties with Nazi Germany. Soon the war refugee committee approved Wallenberg for a dangerous mission. At the end of June 1944, he was appointed first secretary at the Swedish legation in Budapest with the mission to start a rescue operation for the Jews. <clears throat> a friend of Wallenberg, a Swedish political figure, Bjorn Bruckhardt, who had met Wallenberg in South Africa, described him this way. Rolf did not do things in a normal manner. His way of thinking was often overly complicated and convoluted, but his intellect impressed everyone, and he could outtalk anyone. <laughs> Perhaps his greatest asset was his charm which influenced people to respect him. He was an intellectual and he had a remarkable inner strength and a core of fighting spirit. Furthermore, he was a clever negotiator and organizer. Unconventional and extraordinary in, in, in inventive. Brookhart became convinced no one was better qualified for the assignment in Budapest than Rolf. Wallenberg did not use traditional diplomacy. He more or less shocked the diplomats at the Swedish legation with his unconventional methods. Everything from bribes to threats were used with success. He used whatever means he deemed necessary. But when the rest of the staff of the legation saw how Wallenberg had this got results, he quickly got their support. <clears throat> Wallenberg searched desperately for suitable people to bribe and found a very powerful ally in Paul Sully, a high ranking officer in the Hungarian police force, and then Arrow Cross member. Arrow Cross was the Hungarian Nazi party. After the war, Salai was the only Arrow Cross member that wasn't executed. <clears throat> he was set free in recognition of his cooperation with Wallenberg. According to my parents, however, Salai had blood on his hands, and he was a brutal Nazi. But because Wallenberg paid him large sums of money, he cooperated to some extent, some extent. Wallenberg was also employed, also employed his own financial resources to buy off German officials, officials in order to achieve <clears throat> his ends. He had to immediately befriend them, cajole them, and remind them that at war's end, they would be treated as criminals rather than combatants on the losing side of the conflict. He created <clears throat> cells of spies who provided him with information on the Hungarian fascist political establishment. I was born in Budapest on March 1st, 1944, less than three weeks before the Ashes officer Adolf, Adolf Eichmann arrived in March 19th to begin the deportation of Hungary's Jews.
Between May 14th and July 8th, 1944, some 434,000 men, women, and children were deported on 147 freight trains, most of them to death in Auschwitz. My father on, was one of these trains. On his way to Auschwitz, he jumped off the train and hid in a forest with help from a friendly farmer family until he was found and denounced by Hitler's sympathizers, a neighboring farmer. <clears throat> but he survived. He was sent to a slave labor camp where he was eventually liberated by the Russians. Liberated? Question mark. Mm -hmm. There were outcries about the deportation from the West. The Pope urged the 75-year-old Hungarian regent, Miklos Horthy, to stop the deportation. Roosevelt approved an effort to save some Jews by working with the Hungarian government. Horthy also received a letter from the Swedish king, Gustav I, with an appeal to hard deportations. Horty sent a note back saying he would do everything in his power to ensure that the principles of humanity and justice should be respected. Soon after, on July 9, the Nazi deportations in Hungary were canceled and one train with 1,600 Jews was even stopped at the border and returned to Budapest. Rob Wallenberg arrived in Budapest just after the last deportation, by which time only 230,000 of Hungary's Jews remained. From 1944, Budapest Jews had been ordered into 2,600 <coughs> so-called Yellow Star Houses, effectively holding centers prior to later deportation. Wallenbeck's first task was to design a Swedish protective pass, called Schutz Pass, to help the Jews against the Germans and, the, and their Hungarian allies. With some previous experience, Wallenberg had noted that both the German and Hungarian authorities lacked flashy symbols. He therefore had the passes printed in yellow and blue with the three crowns of Sweden crest in the middle and the appropriate stamps and signatures throughout. Of course, Wallenberg's protective passes had no authenticity. <laughs> According to the international law, but they generated respect. It's likely, too, that the Nazis tolerated the passes so long as they affected only a minority of the Jews. The Nazis probably figured they could disregard the passes whenever they wanted, but one big strategy was to delay. With the Allies winning the war, he believed the longer people could be maintained under Swedish protection, the more survivors there would be. At the start, Wallenberg was only he was only given permission to issue 1,500 of these passes. Quickly so, he managed to negotiate another 1,000, and through promises and empty threats to the Hungarian foreign ministry, he eventually managed to raise the quotas to 1,500 protective passes. <clears throat> In reality, Wallenberg managed to issue 
more than three times as many protective passes as he was officially allowed. He also used the war refugee court and Swedish funds to establish hospitals, nurseries, and soup kitchens, and created some 30 Swedish safe houses in the part of the city called Pest, where Jews seek refuge. This is actually where my mother and I survived. This is where we, my mother went with me as an infant. A Swedish flag hung in front of each door and Wallenberg declared the house Swedish territory. The population of the Swedish houses soon rose to 15,000. All because of Wallenberg's other neutral, other, all because of Wallenberg, other neutral negations also issued their own protective passes. A number of diplomats from other countries were inspired to open their own protective houses for Jewish refugees. Chief amongst these, these was the Swiss charge affair, Karl Lutz, who devised his own safe pass and also sheltered hundreds of Jews in safe houses, including his famous glass house where 300 Jews were kept safe from Nazis and their collaborators. This is how my mother and subsequently my life was saved, by the shift pass and living in one of these Wallenberg safe houses. <clears throat> this, this was for pregnant women and women with very young children. In October 1944, the arrow cross took over Hungary and Eichmann returned to Budapest on October 17th to resume the reportations. Under his command, more than 60,000 Jews were forced on a merciless march westward to Austria. They were compelled to build fortifications. Approximately 70,000 others were forced into the Budapest ghetto. At the same time, some 30,000 Jews were possessed. Letters of protection were given places in safe houses. Between December 1944 and January 1945, as many as 20,000 Jews were murdered by the Arab Cross, the Hungarian Nazi Party. My father always told me that the Hungarian Nazi party were worse, equally as bad as the German, if not worse. <clears throat> my grandmother was, was one of those. She went to visit my mother, her daughter, at the safe house on her way back to her apartment during the curfew, was picked up on the street by Arab soldiers. That's my grandmother. Um, with several other unfortunate people, she was marched to the banks of Daniel and shot to death. <clears throat> Today on the embankment of the Daniel, one can see metal shoes lined up to remember those martyrs and my mother, my grandmother's shoes are one of them mm -hmm. on the embankment of Budapest. Toward the end of the war, when the situation became mm -hmm. increasingly desperate, Wallenberg <clears throat> issued a simplified form of the protective pass. One page is his signature alone in the existing chaos even that worked. The nearly installed Hungarian Nazi government soon let it be known 
that with the change of power, the protective passes were no longer valid. Wallenberg saw was undeterred and soon befriended the Baroness Elizabeth Lisa Kameni, wife of the foreign minister, and with her cooperation, the passes were made valid again. While Eichmann's killers were transporting Jews in full trains, Wallenbeck intensified his rescue efforts. He even climbed the train wagons, stood on the tracks, run along the wagon routes, and handed bunches of protective passes down to the people inside. And the Germans, as the, the German soldiers were ordered to fire, but were apparently impressed by Wallenbeck's courage and rank, they deliberately aimed high. Wallenbeck would jump down unharmed and demand that Jews with passes leave the train together with him. This is a story from a survivor who was a friend of my father. He told his story. I was forced out of to one of the Swedish safe houses and taken to a brick factory, factory yard. It was only minutes before we boarded the death train. Suddenly, two cars drove up. There was Wallenberg in one, Hungarian and German officials in the other, in the second car. Raul jumped out of his car, shouting that all those with Swedish papers were under his protection. I was one of the 150 people saved that day. There is an interesting story regarding Wallenberg and Eichmann. I'm sure everybody knows the name Eichmann. Is anybody here mm -hmm. the name? Okay. Um, and Matt, there's an interesting story regarding Wallenberg and Eichmann. A man who will always live in infamy, Adolf Eichmann, and one of the kindest and most courageous men who ever lived, Rob Wallenberg, actually met and had dinner together. It happened in Budapest. Eichmann's mission was to kill as many Jews as possible before the end of the war. The Nazis were, clear, the Nazis were clearly losing and <clears throat> the Russian army was closing in on Budapest. Wallenberg, a member of the Swedish delegation to Hungary, had spent the previous six months saving thousands of Hungarian Jews. Eichmann had already threatened to kill Wallenberg when they met by chance in the foreign ministry building in Budapest. But with typical boldness and audacity, Wallenberg invited Eichmann to dinner. <laughs> the dinner took place in the home of Lars Berg, who was a playwright. And Berg described their, their conversation in detail in his book, the book called What Happened in Budapest. His description has been quoted in many <clears throat> biographies of Wallenberg. According to Berg, Lars Berg, <clears throat> Wallenberg knew that negotiation with Eichmann was hopeless. But in but in their discussion, but in their discussion, Wallenberg brilliantly picked the Nazi doctrine apart piece by piece. Eichmann had little defense and admitted that Wallenberg's analysis was correct. <clears throat> Astoundingly, he admitted that he had never believed in Nazism. Then why did he support the party so willingly and so vigorously? Why did he supervise the murder of millions of people? Berg quotes Eichmann as saying that Nazism has given me power and wealth. And Eichmann wanted to keep his power and wealth as long as he could. 
I know that this, is, this pleasant life of mine will soon be over, said Eichmann. My plans will no more bring me women and wine from Paris, or delicacies from the Orient, my horses, my dogs, my luxur luxurious quarters here in Budapest will soon be taken over by Russians, and I myself, as an SS officer, will be shot on the spot. <coughs> But if I obey my orders and exercise my power, <clears throat> harshly enough, I may prolong my respite for some time. <clears throat> In other words, Eichmann's incredibly evil behavior was not driven by ideology but by this desire for personal, physical pleasures. The contrast is the compassion at Wallenberg could not be clearer. By Wallenberg was one of the few human, humans ever to reach this high level of moral development. principled conscience, or on, a, or on a Talmudic term, the way of the pious, one must put Eichmann at the lower stages, feel of human punishment and, and self-interest. At the end of the evening, Eichmann politely sent Wallenberg for a pleasant evening. Soon after, a truck rammed Wallenbeck's car, an obvious attempt on his life. <clears throat> Which was engineered by Eichmann. Wallenbeck confronted him in person the next day. Eichmann said, regretted the incident, but as Wallenbeck left Eichmann's office, Eichmann said, I will try again and I will succeed. <coughs> One man looked forward to better times following the defeat of the Nazis, but the Russians came as conquerors, not liberators. They considered the local population as an enemy. They seized thousands of Budapest civilians for forced labor, many never to return. Accustomed to the misery of Stalin's socialist paradise, Russian soldiers went wild, robbing people everywhere. They broke into apartments. Most Budapest women had horrifying stories to tell about brutal rape by the Russian soldiers. My mother, who was a young and very attractive woman at the time, made herself look old and frumpy to avoid Soviet army <coughs> harassment and abuse. On February 13, 1945, Russian soldiers banged on the door of the cellar apartment where Wallenberg was sleeping. Wallenberg kept changing homes. He never slept in the same apartment twice. He came from one building to the next. He then moved from one building to the next. They demanded that Wallenberg show his papers. And in response, Wallenberg asked, is it on? No. <laughs> right now? It's on. Yes. OK. And, and in response, Wallenberg asked to see the, division, the division's commanding officer, hoping to discuss plans for, for protecting the Jewish population. Four days later, on January 17, 1945, upon the invitation of the Rus Russian commanding officer, Wallenberg and his driver, Wilmos Schlagenfelder, began a journey to Debrecen, located 120 miles east of Budapest, where the Soviets and the provisional Hungarian government were headquartered. The exact purpose of the trip is unknown. Also, the possibility is that Wallenberg wanted to discuss 
to protect the Jews from the Nazi Hungarian stocks once the Red Army left the country. The Red Army never left the country, by the way. <laughs> um, for a long time. Okay. <clears throat> However, along the way to the meeting, Wolland and his driver were taken into custody by Soviet forces, the NKVD, later known as the KGB, KGB who placed Wolland and his driver Lagenfelder in separate Soviet prison cells in Lubyanka, according to eyewitnesses. What happened to the two men remains a big question mark, as they were never seen or heard again by the outside world. Wallenberg, for the, the, the greatest hero of the 20th century, vanished into the wretched Soviet gulag, and his fate continues to be an agonizing mystery today. The Soviets were aware that Wallenberg was someone to reckon with. Since thousands of documents circulated around Budapest with his signature, the Soviets considered him to be a likely adversary because of his well-known capitalist family and his education in the United States. The Soviets further suspected that Wallenberg's work must be a cover. They didn't see why a Christian would put his life at risk to save Jews. Why else would somebody stay in such a hellish environment, except being a spy? Recently released CIA documents suggest that Wallenberg did, in fact, help keep Washington informed about anti-Nazi resistance forces struggling to break the wartime alliances between Budapest and Berlin. But there can be no doubt such work was byproduct of his mission to save human lives. It, it would take some time before authorities in Stockholm became concerned about Ralph Weinberg's disappearance. In a letter to the Swedish ambassador in Moscow, the Russian foreign minister declared that the Russian military authorities had taken measures to protect Wallander. Many people have drawn the conclusion that Sweden had an opportunity to negotiate for Wallenberg's release after the war, after the war, but they missed their chance. The Soviets, of course, expected Wallenberg to be sent home. But the Swedes, of course, expected Wallenberg to be sent home soon. When nothing happened, Rolf's mother contacted the Russian ambassador in Stockholm, who explained to her that she should be calm since her son was well kept in Russia. The Russian ambassador also told the Swedish foreign minister that it would be best for Wallenberg if the Swedish government would stay out of it. His Swedish, the, the Swedish government was selling steel and aluminum to Nazi Germany during the war, and they were in a precarious situation in international circles. In April 1956, Sweden's Prime Minister, Tag Erlander, traveled to Moscow, where to meet the Soviet representatives of Nikita Khrushchev. This man promised to investigate what happened to Ralph Wallenberg. This turned out to be only lip service. On February 6, 1957, the Russians announced that they had made extensive, extensive investigations and found the document most likely regarding Wallenberg. The 
in the heart of its written love, it was stated that prisoner born back passed away in his cell. The document was dated July 17, 1947. In 1965, there was a speech from Tad Allen there regarding the research around Rod Wallenberg. Erland then conducted that all efforts that had been taken shortly after the war concluded without results. In fact, the Soviet authorities had even denied knowledge of Wallenberg. Mm -hmm. The Wallenberg family in the 70s approached Secretary of State Henry Kissinger to use diplomacy with the Soviets to find out about Wallenberg's fate. But at that time, it appears the U.S. was not interested. Kissinger would take action for Wallenberg because Sweden had been critical of President Nixon's decision to bomb Cambodia. In 1970, Jimmy Carter discovered the story of Wallenberg, and he said, he was such an important figure as a righteous Gentile, a person who had risked to his address, saved, saved thousands of Jews. We must find out more about him, including, including his faith. In, the, in a White House Rose Garden ceremony in October 1st, 1981, President Ronald Reagan signed a special joint congressional resolution that has only occurred twice in American history and extended honorary citizenship to someone born outside the United States. A refugee from World War II Hungary had introduced the resolution a few months earlier his name was Representative Thomas P. Lantos, the only Holocaust survivor, a Hungarian, served in Congress and had recently been elected to his first term. The first bill he proposed was to honor the man who had saved his life. I have to mention, when I was a teenager in Budapest, I was a very good friend with his younger brother. He was quite older than us, and his younger brother and I hang out. We were friends. And, um, and met, I met Tom Wantos in that apartment several times. Uh, of course, you know, I didn't know him well, but I just met him. I knew his brother very well. President Reagan noted that Raul Wallenberg saved not just the life of Tom Wantos, but of tens of thousands of Hungarian Jews and accomplished one of the greatest humanitarian feats in history. But unfortunately, our guest of honor is not present. His fate is a mystery. President Reagan noted that Ron Wallenberg saved not just the life of Tom Lantos, but tens of other Hungarian Jews. <clears throat> and accomplished one of the greatest humanitarian feats of history. But what he did and he accomplished was biblical proportion. Very where he is, his humanity burns like a torch. Um, this, is, this is a monument in Budapest and Nottingham, Germany. That's his briefcase, and that's just a monument. Um, it's in Tel Aviv, his memorial in Tel Aviv. And this is Rob Wallenberg, and his life was one of remarkable triumph and terrible tragedy. Today, the Swedish government wants to use him as a great humanitarian because it is in their interest to have his name known all over the world. Ron Wallenberg long ago joined the ranks of immortal, immortals. People will continue to be inspired by his heroism, which saved so many human beings from hideous evil. Very well, this beloved man is now. 
he will endure as the great angel of rescue who redeemed hope for humanity and liberty. Thank you. I wonder if you still have the, the, sh the no, shoes from your mother. No, we don't have no. them, unfortunately. I don't know what happened to it. I don't know what happened to it, but uh, no, we never had it. I mean, I never had it. I've seen it. I don't know what happened to my, my parents' shoes, my mother's shoes. That's a good question. I wish I had now. So, when did, so when, did, when, did, when, did you, when did you and your, when did you and your, and your, and your family come to come here to the States? I came with um, my parents to Germany. <clears throat> Bert was West Germany in 1965. And I came to the United States in 1966. Right. So I've been here since 1966. There's someone in the back. Oh, David, hi. Um. You said during your presentation that Wallenberg's family had a company that was dealing with the Nazis trading company. Did he was he aware of that, or do you know anything about how how the Wallenberg family well, allowed? He, he knew he knew his family was involved with the Germans. They were the steel steel factory, aluminum steel. They made weapons for the for the Nazis. <coughs> he was aware of that, but he had nothing to do with it. Yes, did you have siblings? No, I'm an only child. Mm -hmm. I never had a siblings. Mm -hmm. Was my big chagrin of my mother. My father was always one foot <coughs> out of the country, so he was he never wanted another child. Mm -hmm. So I never had a sister or brother. <coughs> mm -hmm. Any other question? Yeah? Uh -huh. So did it from the time that you were in the safe house? Mm -hmm. No, I, I am um, the same as just during the war. Um, after the, re the liberation by the Russians, you know, it was not a liberation, but that's what they called it. My parents got, you know, got out and uh, moved back. My grandparents on the apartment block on the Danube. And my parents moved back to that building, and that's where I lived after the war on the, with my parents. But uh, no, the safe house was only just for a short time. Yeah? Paul? Was, was it sweet? <clears throat> Was the Swedish government consistently supportive of Wallenberg's efforts? Not when why he was why he was in Hungary and trying to save Jews. No, they had nothing to do with it. You know, uh, they they didn't even lift a finger to get him out uh, of of uh, they the, the cousins. He had two cousins who were in a business, and they did nothing to actually lobby for him to get out of. Uh, mm -hmm. Of, of, of Russia, of, of Soviet Union, was in Lubyanka, or when he was in Hungary. Hungary but no, they did nothing. Only after the war, when now he's he's regarded so highly and and everybody respected him, now they want to capitalize on his name. Yeah. Uh, you referred to one of the safe houses. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I, I'm a teacher. So. <laughs> <laughs> you, refer, you refer to one of the safe houses. Glass house. Glass house. Can yeah. you explain that? Well, it was 
um, it was uh, uh, um, built and run and managed by Carl Lutz, who was a Swiss contemporary of Rob Lander, and it was an equivalent of a safe house. It just called a glass house because it was lots of glass. Oh, yeah, but it, it, it was, it just, uh, uh, anybody been to Budapest here? Any been to Budapest? Have you seen the, say, the glass house? No. no. Have you gone to the Danube? Oh, of course. The shoes? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Anybody else been to Budapest? Yeah, you have a so, I've been to Budapest. So. You've been to Budapest, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, well, I just wanted to mention I'm, uh, grew up in Sweden. And, uh, I'm sorry? I am Swedish myself. Oh, great. And uh, I wanted to mention the fact that even though the government was a little bit late in maybe uh, attempting to rescue and, and find water, there is a huge, it is a huge movement Oh yeah, after the uh, war, yes. And other oh, yeah. Yeah. After the war, after, but not while he was alive. Okay. They didn't do anything. No. I know. I, I did a lot of cleaning. Okay. And they did nothing till till after the war, like maybe early fifties. Yeah. That's when they started to promote his name and his idea, and then. Of course, it, it, it came to the United States, and like I said about Jimmy Carter, mm -hmm. found his name, and, and, and Reagan did a big tribute to him, so, right. but... Um, uh, and the other thing I might mention is, outside the United Nations, there is a very moving monument mm -hmm. to him, it's a briefcase. Yes, I showed the briefcase. That the was on the, on, the, on the visuals, yeah, yeah the so briefcase. Yeah, he has lots of memorials. In every day, Budapest in Tel Aviv, in Germany, uh, Sweden, he had a lot of, he's a lot of monument. It's a lot of monument, right? Yeah? Let me ask you like a trailer question for these two. So, um, did they, it's amazing the authority that he claimed and was respected, you know, throughout the, the disbelieving years. But do, did the Swedish government support his authority then? I mean, he was claiming, you know, as a, as a Swedish representative, he was doing all these amazing things, but did he actually get any support from the no, government? No, no, nothing, nothing. He had money so he, from his family, okay. so he used his own money. He had connections through the, the, the Swedish, his grandfather was a diplomat, so he had connections, but the actual the government didn't do anything. Not fast, fast, I know whatever I read, there was nothing indicated that they did any six of attention. Yeah? Has Kissinger's stance been criticized? I, I didn't hear that, but he should have been because he had a lot to do with it because he, Nixon's, um, Nixon's um, um, the regime during, during the Nixon's time, they were more worried about um, Cambodia and bombing Cambodia than the one is in the house. So, no, Nixon didn't, Kissinger didn't do much either. That's interesting because he was Jewish. I know, yes, but it doesn't matter. Anything else? Do you, yeah, yes. And then, how much do you remember, or do you, what do you remember about living in Hungary after the war and what that was like? I, I was born in 44, and I left Hungary in 65, so I was 21. I was 21 years old, so I, I, I spent most of my young, you know, adolescent and young, small um, child and, and teenager and all the way to college in Hungary. So I, I of course, I remember that. Um, what about, you know, after the war in terms of level of anti-Semitism? Oh yeah, there was plenty, there was plenty of anti-Semitism. We were just discussing it at dinner with, Sharon and Paul, and I was telling them that I must have been about 12 or 13 years old. And you know, and, and when I, it was no school bus, or my mother didn't take the car to drive me to school, so I, I walked from our apartment building to the school, uh, which wasn't that far. And one day, in a snowy uh, winter day, I was remembered coming home 
and there were some kids playing with the snow and throwing snowball at me and calling me the dirty Jew. Mm -hmm. So when I came home, I couldn't stop sobbing. I was crying and crying and crying. So my father said, this is it. You don't go to Hungarian schools anymore. So he enrolled me to a Jewish school, which they had a Jewish uh, gymnasium and high school. So I went to this Jewish high school in Budapest. And um, so, because he just didn't want me to put me through again, something like that, it was very painful. And my, you know, my, I was always the outside there because I didn't live in a Jewish community. My friends were Gentiles. And uh, I was always different and, you know, that was, of course, anti-Semitism was light and well when I lived there. I'd like to thank Judith very much for being here. Any questions? Mm -hmm. Any other questions? One question? Mm -hmm. Yeah, somebody. You've sort of grown up in the age of fear, really. Yes. So it, I'm curious. Is there a time where you felt safe? What would be like the first time you felt safe? Well, I, growing up Budapest, you never felt safe because my father had a business. He was a capitalist in their eyes. And every night he would go to bed worrying that the communists would come in the middle of the night and do a house search. Because my father was not a communist, he was a capitalist. He had a business which he ran for um, till I was um, 18, so what, what, like uh, 18 years, you know. And, uh, and then, the, then the communists nationalized it and they came in and took it, took it from him. But, um, so I, I don't think I ever felt, and then also my, pet, my mother had people, you know, help who lived in, in an apartment, was big enough to have some living help, and those days people had that. Uh, and I remember when my parents would talk, they would go into the bathroom, for example, or, or close the doors and put the radio on because we were afraid that uh, the living uh, help would be spying on, you know, spying on them. So I, it was always worried about if they overhear us and the concierge would hear us in the building. And you had to speak softly because the walls, because through the walls. And, it was, um, my, 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 my mother, the fact that my parents were not communists, but they were capitalists in their, in their communist uh, view, and uh, we had the, you know, it wasn't safe. It was always worry. There was always worry. Thank you again. Upcoming programs, there's a paper in the back you can take. They'll list you down there. Thanks.